The Runaway King, Chapter 36. It was the pain that eventually awoke me. The shock of Rodin's strike had sent me into unconsciousness, but that had gradually evolved into a restless and unproductive sleep. The chains around my wrists were too high on the wall to allow me to sit on the ground, so when I tried to balance on my injured leg and adjust my weight, a bolt of pain tore through me. My eyes flew open and I cried out. When I focused on Eric and Fink, I saw them standing on their end of the room, staring at me in horror. How long was I out? I mumbled. Neither of them responded, so I focused directly on Fink. How long? A couple of hours, maybe. It wasn't quite dark yet. From the angle of the sun coming through the windows, I guess they were still, there was still another two or three hours until sundown. Not much time. How does it feel? Fink asked. Like butterfly kisses. What do you think? I leaned on my head back to stretch out the muscles, but it did little good. <clears throat> my neck had been in one position for so long, it was now angrily protesting any attempts to use it. Why did you talk to Rodin like that? Eric asked, clearly still upset with me. I made a mistake, I said. My hope had been that if I got Rodin angry enough, he would challenge me to fight another sword fight. Clearly that plan hadn't worked. Here's what I don't understand, Eric said. You were a king. You had everything. Now you've sunk to our level and you'll lose in everything. Not only your life, but he'll come for your kingdom too. You're wrong on all counts, I said. I'm still a king. My title isn't determined by my crown. It's in my blood. Gregor is imprisoned here, so at least for now, my kingdom is safe. Then I looked directly at Eric, and my stature never sank. When I joined you, you may be a thief, but there is far more good in you than bad. I'm better off for knowing you. Eric's eyes fluttered, and he finally looked down, silent. I turned my attention to the more immediate problem. Rodin wasn't clear about when the supper would begin tonight, but without question, I was running out of time. The complication was that Imogen's pen was in the boot of my leg that Rodin had broken. I made a vain attempt to wiggle the foot, even though I knew it would hurt and would be useless in helping to remove the boot. I couldn't get my hands down as far as my feet to pull it off, and even if I could, the manacle around my ankle made the boot tighter than usual. I nodded at Fink, calling him to come. He hesitated and said, Don't make me beg for help. Come here, please. Fink glanced at Eric, who didn't acknowledge him, and then crossed the room to me. As gently as you can, you've got to get this boot off my foot. I winced as I spoke, and Fink paled. To encourage him, I added, There's a little, if they are a little big on me anyway, so they should slide easily. Just go slow. Fink knelt beside the injured leg. I couldn't do anything to lift it for him, and when he raised it slightly and tugged at the heel, I cried out and told him to stop. New plan, I said between shallow breaths. Try rolling the leather down. Fink touched the top of my boot. He pulled at the sides, and the pain flared inside me, but this time it was him who gave up. I think that might be worse than just pulling it off, he said. Still on the side of the room, Eric muttered something to himself and then stood up. Without looking at me, he reached into his own boot and he pulled out a small folding knife. Back off, he ordered Fink, who quickly obeyed. Then he went down on one knee and began cutting the leather down its side. It was a slow process since the knife was so small, and every time he moved my leg, even by a hair, I gasped and tried not to pass out again. When he reached the sole, it was a comparatively easy thing to lift the rest of the boot free from my foot. There's a pin in it, I said between breaths. Give it to me. Let me do it, Fink said. You can't reach the lock on those chains anyway. Fink widened the pin to its full length, then slid one end into the manacles locked around my wrists. He toyed with it until he found the lever he was seeking. With one careful push, there was a clicking sound, and the manacles pulled apart. 
He next went to work on the ankle manacles, and when they unlocked, he was very careful in removing them. Free from the chains, I crumpled to the ground. It hurt to fall, but my good leg was too tired to lower me more carefully. What now? Fink asked. The lock is on the other side of the door. We're still stuck in this room. I glanced up at the window, grateful for the first time that I had recently become so thin. Eric stared at me, incredulous. Do you know where we are? More than a stone's throw above the beach and nearly the same below the cliff top. There's nowhere to go. Fink pressed close to Eric's side and whispered to him. Rodin said he could climb. Up a cliff? Eric shook his head. Maybe with two good legs, but not one. Punch out the glass, I told Fink. Then pray there's no one below us. Fink held out his hand for Eric's knife. Eric sighed loudly before handing it over. Then Fink grabbed the chair from the corner to stand on while he broke out the glass. We waited in silence for the sound of footsteps outside the door, but none came. Rodin would want a big dinner. I was sure he was keeping everyone occupied. When the window had cleared, I gestured to the chair on which Fink had stood. Now break that. Don't splint the longer pieces. A leg brace? Eric muttered. Yeah, that'll make all the difference. But he went to the chair anyway and began hitting it against the wall. While he did, I asked Fink to remove his shirt and rip it into the longest lengths he could. Then I laid my head flat on the floor and closed my eyes. Rodin was going to regret having done this to me. I would make sure of it. With one final hit, the last joints of the chair fell apart. Most of it came to pieces in unusable sections, but Eric was able to break away enough to end up with one straight piece of wood nearly as long as my entire leg. I told him to break it even more. I needed to bend my knee if I was going to keep my balance. They did the rest of the work without further instructions. Fink held a piece of wood both on the inside and outside of my leg while Eric tied the strips from the shirt as tightly as he could. I hated that I needed their help, all the while knowing this would have been impossible to do on my own. My leg still pulsed with pain, but once it was braced with the wood, it was more manageable than before. I stood and tested my stance on the floor. I made no effort to put my weight on my injured leg, thankful the years of climbing and walking on narrow ledges had given me good balance and strength. Now scoot the table beneath the window, I said. You've got no chance on that cliff, Eric said. I'd rather fall from that cliff than wait here to be killed. The fear I felt came out sounding like anger. Now help me, please. You are a complete fool, Eric said. So I've been told, I said. I stared at each of them a moment and said, I think I'll be discovered before anyone comes looking for me, but in case I'm wrong about that, you should come up with a story to explain how I escaped here on my own. I knew that I'd hate you before this was over, said Eric. I'm sorry you do. You're one of the only few of a few people who I would have preferred to like me, Eric. Eric looked down at the knife, sighed heavily, then held it out to me. Take it. But I shook my head. No, it's your last defense. I've taken enough from you already. I sat on the table and then got to a standing position. I clamped my fingers around the windowsill, but there was no traction on the wall for my foot. Eric sighed again and pushed the table away, using his own strength to lift me until I angled my way through the window. I paused to sit on the windowsill with everything but my legs already on the outside. A cool breeze washed up from the sea below us, and I took that in with a deep breath. Eric had underestimated the distance, both to the ground and the cliff above me. The texture of the cliff wall was better than I'd hoped for. Vines and plants grew dense and well-rooted, and there were many rocks and missing chunks of earth. I didn't know whether I could make it to the top on one leg or not, but I thought it was a good day to try.